In competitive Splatoon, you make one of the most important choices in a game before the timer starts ticking. You choose a weapon. In a game with this many weapons, there's a truly enormous number of different combinations of those weapons, and deciding which weapons to play is one of the most difficult analytical questions to answer, which is why there's so much content about it. There's a whole series of books to be written about weapon compositions, so I'm not going to try to get into the subject very deeply, but I will talk about some rules of thumb you want to follow in building a weapon composition. As I suggested in the title, yes, this video does apply to solo queue, Reason being that if you understand weapon compositions, you can look at your team's weapons and the enemy team's weapons at the beginning of the game and develop an understanding of your win condition that you wouldn't have otherwise. I start every VOD review I do with an analysis of the friendly and enemy weapon comps for this reason. It helps you make decisions within the situation the game stuck you with. With that focus in mind, let me make a quick disclaimer that as complex as this topic is, there will be some generalizations and simplifications that I'm making that may not always hold up for every comp, especially more experimental comps that you might see played at top level. I've seen some weird things work in this game, sometimes even for good reasons. If you understand why a comp works, don't let me stand in the way of you playing it. But if this video raises issues you hadn't thought about, maybe reconsider weapon choices on those grounds. Title sequence. My first point here is one I've already made a video about, so I'll be quick about it, but I'll put in a video card linking to it so you can watch that if you want more information. A lack of frontline weapons typically hamstrings a weapon comp, slowing down the pace at which it can push the enemy team back on defense and also score for itself. In a coordinated competitive context, I strongly recommend against running double backline compositions unless you have a plan for how to take space with it, and you should always run at least two weapons that are comfortable being the furthest weapon forward on the map, the, the first weapon the enemy team will be engaging with in a fight. If you don't have at least two aggressive weapons, as soon as one of them goes down, which of course is likely to happen since they're the first player on the team to get engaged on, you largely lose the ability to push the enemy team until that player respawns. In a solo queue context, you can't control whether the game gives you these comps or not, but you can recognize the disadvantage you're at and try your best to compensate for it. If you're playing a Splattershot Jr. and you typically play a supportive role, but you're matched up with two chargers and a heavy splatling, you're the best weapon on your team at pushing up on the front lines, so your team will probably need you to do that instead of riding the tower. You may normally play the role of tower rider on your team, but that roster of teammates really needs you pushing up in front of the tower to make it safe to ride, because the rest of them would probably prefer to play behind the tower if they had their way. Summon your inner t tech and go trap some players at splat bombs. The heavy splatling player on that comp should also lean more into the midline playstyle than the backline playstyle, because they'll still have the chargers playing more of an anchor role if they push up a bit more. Maybe consider positioning a little more like a Nautilus in that sort of situation. Another common problem to look for on a team comp is low paint output. My typical rule for weapon comps is that you want no more than one weapon on a team that doesn't paint very well, especially in splat zones or turf war. If the game gives you two blasters and you're a 52 gal, your plan might have been to play aggressively up until this point, but seeing the weapon comp you've been given, it becomes more important than usual for you to take the time to paint the map, because your teammates can't do that as effectively for themselves. This consideration becomes especially important if either team has an ambush weapon, a weapon that relies heavily on stealth to get close to the enemy team and go for splats. These weapons, often rollers, blasters, or very short-ranged weapons like dapples, often paint pretty poorly for themselves, so if you can put paint down in a wide enough perimeter around you, they'll have to paint through it before they can get in range of you, and that'll both slow them down and give you advance warning that they're coming, both of which make it more likely that you get a favorable outcome in that fight. If you have a carbon roller on your team, and you keep the map really well painted for it, it can have a field day with the enemy team. And even if your KA is maybe a little lower at the end of the game, they can more than make up for it and screen cap two Twitter clips to boot. If you don't keep the map painted well enough though, that carbon is boxed out of the game really hard, 
at which point you're effectively down a teammate. They can't get splats, and since that's the major benefit their weapon can provide to the team, they're not going to do much for you at all. An important consideration about paint is that a weapon's playstyle factors into this heavily. A charger, for example, takes a long time to be able to fire a charged shot, and shots are hard to hit. So it's going to take a while once it's set up to really get significant value. If it were spending all that time painting with tap shots, it would be a pretty solid painting weapon, but it's not going to do that, because you pick charger to be able to control areas of the map and remove enemy players from play. It's also more likely to be playing near friendly ink because it's going to position further back. So a frontline weapon pushing the enemy team back is going to encounter more turf that it will incidentally paint over while doing its typical job. In short, just because the weapon is capable of painting well doesn't mean a player on that weapon is doing the best job they can if they specifically focus on painting for a significant amount of the match. While it is a problem not to have enough pushing power, something which typically comes from shorter ranged weapons, a lack of weapon range can also be a liability. That's not to say that every composition needs a backline anchor weapon, but if the other team does end up having one, it will be a problem that you need an answer for, as it will be able to take pot shots at your whole team and not have to worry about peeking, say, an enemy E-leader while it does so. While Crab Tank is definitely one big reason the splash matic is the meta weapon right now, another really important reason is the Burst Bomb, which allows it to effectively function as a much longer ranged weapon than it would with anything else. The Splatana Stamper is another pillar of competitive play right now, in part because it not only has a Burst Bomb, but also equivalent weapon ranged combo with it. That Charge Slash has more range than the Bamboozler, if you didn't know. Having at least something that can quickly damage an opponent from that far away means that you're able to contest a backline weapon, at least briefly, without having to fully flank it, which is something you often need to be able to take safe engagements as a team. In extreme cases, a lack of weapon range can even make you susceptible to midliners or longer ranged frontline weapons. Sometimes solo queue will take your end zap and put it on a team where it's the longest ranged weapon. If the enemy team has a dually squelchers, good luck approaching, because that weapon not only has insane range, but it's better at kiting than almost any other weapon because of its jump tech. By contrast, if you had a charger or a long range splatling, that dually squelchers would have to think twice about standing out in the open. That whole team gets bullied by a 52 gal or tetras, especially if you end up with weapons like the neo sploosh that don't even have a damaging sub weapon they can poke with. Even if a weapon with better range comes packaged with a slower time to splat, that extra range can still be put to better use if it has damage combos with other members of the team. This is another reason the Splatana Stamper, Sloshing Machine, and splash matic are such strong options in the current state of the game. If an opponent splats you, but you land a few shots first, which do you want trying to trade back? A Neo Sploosh that has to get in punching range of them, or a Splatana Stamper that can hit them from half the width of the map away with a Charge Slash, or land a Horizontal Slash that's really consistent since it has a wide hitbox, or throw a Burst Bomb at them? The Sploosh has a better time to splat, but it's not the correct answer here. It has to do the same thing it always has to do to trade that back, meaning it has to already be in position to chase that player down. The Stamper could be doing something else, Hear that a fight happened, turn, chuck some random chunk of damage at them, and go on with what it was doing before. Burst Bomb Directs combo with Burst Bomb Directs, so if you've got two splashes and a stamper like many teams do, there's probably going to be someone near enough to get the rest of the way through a damaged player's health bar, even if you have to back up. You've got a lot of similar options off a sloshing machine's fizzy bombs, and the safe consistent damage its main weapon can do. It doesn't have a fast time to splat by itself, but it can deal a good amount of damage and keep you away from it, meaning any of the other weapons we've talked about have an easy time doing the rest of the damage themselves. Think about the damage numbers your weapon does, and look at your teammates and see if there are any reliable combos you can pull off with them. That's not to say that chip damage sub-weapons are the only ones to watch out for. If you see vanilla dapple doolies or a neo sploosh or a crack unroller, Keep opening the map and looking for beacons, and expect them to want to flank using the angles aggressive beacons can let them access more quickly. Lethal bombs, especially splat bombs, are still very powerful tools like they were in Splatoon 2. If you just drop bombs under the clam basket while the enemy team is trying to score, you will get splats. If there's a bomb in front of a Rainmaker carrier, it doesn't matter that it's a 4v1 for them. They can't move forward yet. 
the other team gets a free couple seconds off their respawn timer before the Rainmaker is able to start scoring again. If you're pushing into an important area for controlling the objective, and there are two different angles you could get attacked from, a bomb on one of those angles makes it safe to give your full attention to the other one for a short time. It can also flush an opponent out of hiding without your having to have seen them first, or take a backline weapon out of position to defend during an important engagement. Again, it doesn't matter what disadvantages you're at. If there's a bomb at your opponent's feet, they have to move. Being able to reliably move enemy players is extremely powerful. It's the main reason that booyah bombs and crab tanks and missiles have always been such valuable specials. Having to move means the opponents can't be in the position they'd rather be shooting from, and for a short time it also means they can't even be shooting at all, since swimming is so much faster than walking and you can't shoot while swimming. If you notice a teammate has one of those specials, watch for when they use it and push up while those specials are launching. Because if used well, those specials give you free fight wins even against stronger opponents. It's also important to look at what you're going to be up against on the enemy team. If there's a Zipcaster weapon, don't expect cover fire from a backline weapon in every teamfight. They're often going to be busy dealing with Spider-Man behind you. If there are a lot of missiles, be very disciplined not to bunch up too much with your teammates to make sure you always have an escape route that they're not going to cut off by running their missiles behind you. Watch out for when the enemy team has a Booyah or Kraken or Tri-Strike while you're trying to push the tower. Anticipating that special can save a push that would otherwise be lost if you didn't notice it being aimed at the objective. If you end up in a 1v1 with a 96 gal and you feel like you're getting the upper hand, before you overcommit, check the heads-up display and make sure they're not about to pop a Kraken on you and swipe that opportunity away. Certain modes bring a few other considerations. As mentioned, splat zones in Turf War make your weapon's ability to paint a lot more important. In Tower Control, weapons that can hit up over ledges or around corners are a lot more dangerous because that AoE, that is Area of Effect damage, helps them clear tower more easily. We've also already talked about specials like Tri-Strike, Booyah, and Kraken. These specials can end overtime by themselves if used properly so watch out for them to be used at the end of the game in coordination with a teammate to steal the tower while it's impossible for the enemy team to stand on. In Rainmaker, object damage becomes a lot more important because on top of typical tasks like shredding crab tanks, splash walls, and booyah bombs, you now also have the Rainmaker shield, and it's worth considering how many players are running object shredder gear. As you roll out, you want to be sizing up your team and the enemy team and making a call about which one is more likely to win the Rainmaker pop. If you're going to win, contest it, but if you're not, it's worth more to just paint the map and have a special ready faster, so the faster you can decide whether pop is worthwhile and whether your team stands a chance of getting it, the sooner you can make the right call. Look out for lethal bombs since they do really fast burst damage to the shield, and also for weapons with high sustained damage like Dapple Doolies, Sploosh-O-Matics, and Blob Lobbers. Rainmaker also makes it valuable to have fast movement speed and be able to paint a path quickly, because fractions of seconds matter when you're sprinting for lead. In Clam Blitz, watch out for weapons that are going to try to get under your basket to give power clam jumps. If you defend well against these strategies, you'll find they're really gimmicky, rarely score much, and set your team up for larger counter pushes. But you need to enforce the space you have control of and not let anyone through. That becomes more difficult when the enemy team has a Kraken user or a brush that will just roll over the paint you put at their feet. If you have a Splat Bomb or Suction Bomb, you can often use that to counter Power Clam jumps. It's the most reliable way to prevent them from being thrown in when the jump is landing in range of the basket, and even if the clam makes it in, as long as the bomb gets a splat, you're probably still at an advantage now as a team, because you'll be able to overwhelm the player they jumped to, and then be two players up on the enemy team with a pity clam on the way. It's a lot more difficult to line up, but if you have a splash wall, it is theoretically possible to put it on a jump and bounce a player away from the basket to mess their throw up. So if you want something cheeky to learn, go mess around with that with some buddies in Recon. Now, as soon as the opening cutscene plays and you see the weapons both teams are bringing, you have a lot to think about. With some practice, you should hopefully be able to look for these aspects of weapon comps and come up with a good sense of your team's win condition by the time you get to mid and start engaging the enemy team. 